SOA Watch uh, project in Venezuela in 2009, is that correct? And Hannah is a graduate of McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, where she majored in Latin American Studies and Political Science. She is currently finishing a second year of service through the Lutheran <coughs> Volunteer Corps at La Raza Central Legal on 16th and Valencia. She works with day laborers and domestic workers in San Francisco. Let's welcome Hannah. So we wanted to um, mix it up a little bit, and I'm so honored that I get the chance to sit on stage with Father Louie. Um, talking a little bit about our efforts in Latin America, and especially the School of the Americas Watch. So maybe I'll just give a two minute, this is what we do, and then we can start talking. Um, so the School of the Americas Watch, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a organization that has offices in D.C. and in Barquisimeto, Venezuela, where I spent last summer, that is trying to change U.S. foreign policy towards Latin America. Um, and sometimes when I tell people this, they say, well, the Cold War is, is done, and the U.S. isn't really involved in Latin America anymore, so why are you doing this work? Well, because that's not true, right? So we're still, yes, maybe the, um, we talk a lot about what's happening in Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iraq and Palestine, um, but there's a lot of stuff going on in our hemisphere as well. And so we, um, it's, a, it's a great organization, our, uh, if you want more information, it's in the back. Um, and we have a small branch here in San Francisco, and um, it's a really interesting way to try to change this U.S. foreign policy and specifically shut down the School of the Americas, which is where um, troops from most countries in Latin America go to learn how to be good soldiers in their perspective, or in our perspective, to go and learn how to torture their own um, countrymen and women, and how to you know, do coups, which happened in Honduras last year, and so it's a school that we're really trying to shut down, and Father Louis has been on the forefront of the movement for a long time. So with that said, um, I know that the last time, you keep talking about being arrested all of these times, um, and I know the last time you served jail time was for crossing the line in Fort Benning, Georgia. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you decided to do that and what your experience with it was. Well, it's, uh, I guess, the third time I've done, uh, done that and, and gone to prison knowing each time that it would happen. And the first time I went is because of Pax Christi, actually. Pax Christi had, uh, was listing some people as, as uh, teachers of peace. And so I was asked to come and, and, uh, to a meeting, and it was during a summer. And that particular summer, agreed just, uh, there was a snafu in terms of a, College, uh, Catholic college that said no to them coming because of the keynote speaker. <laughs> and uh, that was uh, uh, kind of unfortunate and not a, not a good decision on the school's part. But anyway, they ended up uh, tacking it on to the, to the gathering they have every year at Fort Benning just before the action. And so I was asked to come back there and I said, well, uh, gee, I, it's a long way to go. I was trying to avoid across the country all the time and they finally kind of urged me to David urged me to come and so so I went and I also knew of course what would probably happen if I went there <laughs> that I had never been there and that I knew people got arrested there although they were not for the most part sending people to prison or it was kind of like a lottery who got picked but uh, anyway uh, but I got there and, and they have the procession and I'd been down to Latin America, to Central America, to El Salvador shortly before the Archbishop was killed and visited refugee camps and uh, had known people, families that were the people had been killed and I knew the trauma of it. And uh, when all of a sudden they have this procession and they, you're in the procession and they're calling off the names of, you know, you have these mock coffins and you're calling off the names and sort of matching them in those coffins. And then you get up to the fence and then you turn around and go back, and I couldn't do that. You know, I said, people were saying, well, you're going to get immediately six months, and this and that, and John Deere said, yes. And I said, well, I can't just cut off myself from this. You know, it's like if you're in a memorial here in the city, and somebody that you know and love or something, and then some policeman or somebody comes along and says, no, you can't go because you're, 
you know, you, you look like something, I don't know, uh, your car is too ratty, I don't know. They try to stop you from pointing, you say, well, I'm going to go. I didn't, you tell me that I can't go to that funeral, I'm going to go to the funeral. And I felt that way and, and got, uh, I guess, three months the first time and then the next couple times, six months. But the same thing when I went this year, it was just something, I, I guess it's just, it's just this, I guess the, the energy that I was talking about today, the energy of compassion and love that encases our universe just kind of moves you at times to just respond in certain ways. And I, I was planning just to go to Fort Huachuca last year and I wasn't going to go to Fort Benning, but in the, Fort Huachuca is in Arizona, but I kept giving talks and going in and out of Atlanta, in and out of Atlanta, in and out of Atlanta. I said, well, I might as well just stay back here and I did. And, and uh, so, I mean, it was a really, I, I just felt the urge to do it. And then the fact that it was, came out so neatly. I mean, they had all these gates and guards. And every time you go, there's another fence ever since 9-11. And uh, so the, uh, you know, I was, was uh, it, we went to a different gate and it was just so open and it was so peaceful. We had the remains of someone who had been planning to be there and took those two. And, and it was just very, very uh, congruent and it just felt like the right thing to do. And, uh, it, it turned out to be a good, a good time. I mean, I was in Georgia jail for a few months, couple, no, just a month or two, and then uh, I never believed they would take me to Lop Pockets. I'd been two or three times on trial there and had a band of bar dinner, uh, and I kept saying, no, they're going to take me off. They're going to take me off for this. No, I can't. They're not going to send me to Lop Pocket in the middle of the chicken coop. <laughs> you know? a band of bar later, and I think if I get stopped in there, I can get arrested. No, they're going to take me there? And they did. And they even laughed at that. But uh, um, so as soon as I got out, though, and we went back again. Uh, that was July 23rd, and on August 6th, we, we were the 9th, I guess we were there, and got arrested again. So um, I feel that, that it's important for the sake for, uh, you know, uh, because of the people of Latin America, but I also feel that it's important that we, uh, you know, continue to tie all these together because they're all the same thing. They're all about domination. Uh, if you read Walter Wink and his whole thing about the principalities and powers, it's this domination. The world, when he talks about the world, uh, is, is a domination system. And we are the masters of the domination system. And somehow we have to, you know, dethrone that. And the first thing we have to do is bring it to light. And, uh, Nonviolent efforts seem to be the best way of bringing things to life because people don't get so defensive. A little bit if you're doing nonviolence, but it's pretty hard. Even there, even the guards would come up to me. One of them came up and said, "Do you know this Father Cabot?" He said, "I arrested this person at." at uh, well, he just said, "A priest. I arrested several years ago with a jackhammer and a missile silo." I said, "That's Carl Cabot. It was like 18 years earlier." And he kept asking me about that. And then they got arrested down in Kansas City. They, and somebody sent me a picture, and I showed it to him. He says, yeah, that's him, but he looks older. I said, well, so do you, Jones. But I mean, <laughs> he was concerned about this. He kept bringing it up again and again, how he had arrested this priest. And even over the years, he'd been kind of uneasy about it. It seemed like it'd just be an automatic thing for somebody who's a policeman. Somebody's out there with a jackhammer going at a missile silo. They were, you know, 